Hello, students! Welcome back to Mr. Sandwich Reads at Home Edition. I am Mr. Sandwich, and I am reading Jerry Spinelli's Stargirl. Today, I'm on chapter 20, excuse me. And when we last left off, uh, Leo was left uh, with the question that Archie posed through Senor Saguaro, um, which is, what is more important to you? Uh, being an individual with Stargirl, somebody who you... Uh, care for a great deal they seem romantically involved uh or the uh, attention and approval of everybody else of the the large group um that really is the conflict in this story i think early on if you've been following along i talked about um the four different types of conflict and there are a few others um but we've got person versus person which is um you know just basic i always say batman versus joker you got one individual versus another individual uh, person versus self, which we do see some of that. Leo's sort of um, reflecting. He's having trouble coming to terms with uh, mentally um, difficult decisions to make um, in the scenario around him. Uh, person versus nature, which is like a survival story that does not apply in this case. And then person versus society. And that is what I would say is the main conflict in this story. We saw that highlighted in chapter 19. Um, so just to stress that as a conflict and, and plays into the themes, uh, person versus society. And that is uh, the difficult decision Leo was left off with. Uh, he had trouble sleeping that night, and that's where we left, last left off. So let's see here what Leo does, what he decides. Chapter 20, this is on page 106. Twice a week, the results of the state basketball tournament were posted on the, ply on the plywood roadrunner in the courtyard. The surviving, the surviving teams were into the sectionals now. Then would come the regionals. Then, with only two games left, the big show, the Arizona State Championship. Glendale, the team we had lost to, got bitter masochistic attention on the roadrunner with scores in foot-high numerals as they continued to win and move through the tournament. Meanwhile, Stargirl was involved in a tournament of her own, the Oratorical Contest. As Micah's, Micah High's winner, she qualified for the District Talk Off, as the Times called it. It took place in the auditorium of Red Rock High School, and lo and behold, Stargirl won that too. Next stop was the state finals in Phoenix on the third Friday in April. In my homeroom, when the announcement came over the PA about Stargirl winning the district title, I was about to let out a cheer, but I caught myself. Several people booed. Getting ready for the finals, Stargirl practiced on me. Most often, we went into the desert. She did not use notes, nor did her words seem memorized. Each time she gave the speech, it was different. She seemed to insert new material as it popped into her head. She matched her words so perfectly that the speech was not a speech at all, but one creature's voice in the wild as natural as a raven's caw or a coyote's howl at midnight. I sat cross-legged on the ground. Cinnamon sat on me. We listened in rapture, and so, I half-believe, did the tumbleweed and cacti, the desert, the mountains, all listening to the girl in the long falling skirt. What a shame, I thought, to pack her performance into a schedule and present it to rows of plush back seats in an auditorium. Once, incredibly, an elf owl landed atop a saguaro not ten feet from where she was speaking. It paused for, for a full it, excuse me. It paused for a full minute before ducking into its hole. Of course, we did other things too. We walked, we talked, we rode bikes. Though I had my driver's license, I bought a cheap second hand bicycle so I could ride with her. Sometimes she led the way, sometimes I did. Whenever we could, we rode side by side. That just that remind that that makes me think that they're they're more in tandem. They're more together and parallel with each other than like Kevin and Leo. Uh, the dynamic behind Kevin and Leo's uh, friendship, I think, is, is kind of best uh, summarized with the metaphor of the camera, the hot seat. Um, Kevin's in front of the camera, hogging the attention. Um, Leo's in the background making the decisions behind the scenes, doesn't like to be in front of the camera. Um, so that they have a dynamic there. But here we see them uh, when it describes Stargirl and Leo riding bikes. One of them leads, the other one follows, they take turns, or they ride side by side. So um, a little bit more um, of a, a balance to this relationship. 
She was bendable light. She shone around every corner of my day. She taught me to revel. She taught me to wonder. She taught me to laugh. My sense of humor had always measured up to everyone else's. But timid, introverted me, I showed it sparingly. I was a smiler. In her presence, I threw back my head and laughed out loud for the first time in my life. She saw things. I had not known there was so much to see. She was forever tugging my arm and saying, look. I would look around, seeing nothing. Where? She would point, there. In the beginning, I still could not see. She might be pointing to a doorway or a person or the sky. But such things were so common to my eyes, so undistinguishable, undistinguished, that they would register as nothing. I walked in a gray world of nothings. Ooh, that's that's good to know when you go and uh, read uh, The Giver, if you've already read The Giver. But I know for eighth grade students, you will read The Giver. And uh, that description, we, we can make a text to text connection there. Uh, I walked in a gray world of nothings. Doesn't even perceive the things going on around him. So she would stop and point out that the front door of the house we were passing was blue and that the last time we had passed it, it had been green. And that, as near as she could tell, someone who lived in that house painted the front door a different color several times a year. Or she would whisper to me that the old man sitting alone on the bench at the Tudor Village shopping center was holding his hear hearing aid in his hand, and he was smiling, and he wore a coat and a tie as if he were going somewhere special, and pinned onto his lapel was a tiny American flag. Or she would kneel down and pull me down with her and show me the ants, two of them, lugging the lopped leg of a beetle twenty times their size across the sidewalk, as might two men, were they strong as ants, carry a full-grown tree from one end of town to the other. After a while, I began to see better. When she said, look, and I followed her pointing finger, I saw. Eventually, it became a contest. Who would see first? When I finally did it, said, look, and pointed and tugged her sleeve, I was as proud as a first grader with a star on his paper. And there was more to her seeing than that. What she saw, she felt. Her eyes went straight to her heart. The old man on the bench, for example, made her cry. The lumberjack ants made her laugh. The door of many colors put her in such a snit of curiosity that I had to drag her away. She felt she could not proceed with her life until she knocked on such a door. She told me how she would run the Micah Times if she were the editor. Crime would be on page 10, ants and old men and painted doors on page 1. She made up headlines. Ants haul monster load across vast barren walk. Mystery smile. Old man nods off at Tudor Village. Door begs. Knock me. I told her I wanted to be a t I wanted to be a TV director. She said she wanted to be a silver lunch truck driver. Huh? I said. You know, she said. People work all morning and then it's 12 o'clock. The secretaries in the offices walk out the door. The construction workers put down their hard hats and hammers. And everybody's hungry. And they look up and there I am. No matter where they are, no matter where they work, I'm there. I have a whole fleet of silver lunch trucks. They go everywhere. Lunch come to you. Let lunch come to you. That's my slogan. Just seeing my silver lunch truck makes them happy. She describes how she would roll up the side panels and everyone would practically faint at the cloud of wonderful smells. Hot food, cold food, Chinese, Italian, you name it, even a salad bar. They can't believe how much food I fit into my truck. No matter where you are, out in the desert, the mountains, even down in the mines, if you want my silver lunch service, I get it to you. I find a way. I tagged along on missions. One day, she bought a small plant, an African violet, in a plastic pot on sale for 99 cents at a drugstore. Who's it for? I asked her. I'm not exactly sure, she said. I just know that someone at an address on Marion Drive is in the hospital for surgery, so I thought whoever's back home could use a little cheering up. How do you know this stuff? I said. She gave me a mischievous grin. I have my ways. We went to the house on Marion Drive. She reached into the saddle pack behind her bicycle seat. She pulled out a handful of ribbons. She chose a pale violet one that matched the color of the tiny blossoms and stuffed the remaining ribbons back into the seat pack. 
She tied the violet ribbon around the pot. I held her bike while she set, set the plant by the front door. Riding away, I said, why don't you leave a card or something with your name on it? The question surprised her. Why should I? Her question surprised me. Well, I don't know. It's just the way people do things. They expect it. They get a gift. They expect to know where it came from. Is that important? Yeah, I guess. I never finished that thought. My tires shuddered as I slammed my bike to a halt. She stopped ahead of me. She backed up. She stared. Leo, what is it? I wagged my head. I grinned. I pointed to her. It was you. Me what? Two years ago, my birthday, I found a package on my front step, a porcupine necktie. I never found out who gave it to me. She walked her bike alongside mine. She grinned. A mystery. Where did you find it? I said. I didn't. I had my mother make it. She didn't seem to want to dwell on the subject. She started pedaling, and we continued on our way. Where were we? She said. Getting credit, I said. What about it? Well, it's nice to get credit. The spokes of her rear wheel spun behind the curtain of her long skirt. She looked like a photograph from a hundred years ago. She turned her wide eyes on me. Is it? She said. All right. Is it important to get credit for a gift? Does it feel better to know you got credit? Or if you just saw somebody's reaction, positive reaction, could you keep that a secret to yourself? Would it be just as rewarding if you weren't getting credit for it? For Stargirl, it is just as rewarding. Maybe she feels more rewarded uh, in doing these, these random acts of kindness uh, without getting any credit. Here, though, Leo does figure out, uh, he puts two and two together. If you remember the the prelude to the story, Porcupine Necktie, that has now uh, come back around here, uh, and Leo has figured that out. Um, so, still spending time with Stargirl, based on that chapter 19, when he's left off thinking with that conflict, boy, do I want to be part of the group, part of the society, or do I am I okay being... Um, myself alone with Stargirl. We see he's more connected with nature. He's noticing things um, that he wasn't noticing before. He's laughing harder and openly. Um, what do you think Leo should do? Uh, it, does he seem better off than he was at the beginning of the story? What do you think he will do? Any predictions? All right. I hope you enjoyed. Hope you continue to follow. Hope you subscribe. Um, leave comments, please. Let me know what you think. And if you like the videos, let me know. Give them that thumbs up. All right. Peace. Take it easy.